Thanks for that. Lethal, God. Yeah. I, I had a lethal tongue when I used to drink whiskey. That's a long time ago. Um, I had a, uh, me and my wife had a Siamese cat for 20 years called uh, King Tut, um, uh, the Egyptian kind of Tutankhamun. Um, of course, the Siamese cat looks like one of those cats on the tent. But uh, I was interviewed for the, the Australian magazine once and I was very upset about it because the journalist took photographs of us and the, and the cat was in the picture and he said, an Adamson's cat toots, T-O-O-T. <laughs> and it was an outrage in our house. Um, and after um, 20 years, he died. So here's a poem called Death of a Cat. Siamese seal pointer, ghost cat, my familiar and killer, sleeper under covers, a true carnivore, devoured hundreds of pilchards, maybe thousands, and many baby brown snakes. That pair of kingfisher bodies, first the pale female, jumped and tortured, then the male, who returned to help his mate and met death by tooth and claw. Roller of lizards and skinks, blue-eyed and sleek, bully boy with a foul tongue, most articulate at night, shiny cream-furred cuddler, brown-eared stalker, attention seeker and bird watcher, my wife's tormentor. The one who ate a dozen live garfish, whole, stolen from the bait tank, taut-bodied, razor-footed climber with a sprung rhythm, stuck among branches, yowling, ripping the chairs apart while purring for praise. A legend, according to my son, to my wife, a demented howling beast, my darling and terrible King Tut, who prowled here for 18 years before the mower cut out his kidneys. But that, there's a double reference to Moa. In, there's, a, there's a poem by Philip Larkin where he actually runs over a, 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 some English animal, a mole or something, with, with his uh, lawnmower. So there's that Moa. But I'm referring to the Moa as in the Grim Reaper as mentioned in Marvell's poem. <laughs> <laughs> you only get that if you're, if you're reading it and you see the capital M and you wonder what... Well... This one <laughs> there's a little elegy. Uh, this is called The Stone Curlew. I'm writing this inside the head of a bush stone curlew. We have been travelling for days, moving over the earth, flying when necessary. I am not the bird itself, only its passenger. Looking through its eyes, the world rocks slightly as we move over the stubble grass of the dunes, at night, shooting stars draw lines across the velvet dark as I hang in a sling of light between the bird's nocturnal eyes. The heavens make sense. Seeing this way makes me want to believe that words have meanings, that Australia is no longer a wound in the side of the earth. I think of the white settlers who compared the curlew's song to the cries of women being strangled and remember the poets who wrote anthropomorphically as I sing softly from the jelly of the stone curlew's brain. <clears throat> and uh, this is the poem that was commissioned by Joe for the pigeon, um, the pigeon race. Um, and uh, it's called My Grandfather's Ice Pigeons. When I was a kid, when I was well, I used to run away from Neutral Bay and hide at Mooney Mooney with my grandfather, who was a fisherman. He had no phone, and they couldn't, they couldn't really find me up there. It was very difficult for my mother to um, get me back to school. <laughs> and, um, and this is a poem about what I used to do with my grandfather. My grandfather's ice pigeons. My grandfather would walk into the house on a summer evening after his work then empty his catch of mud crabs into the bathtub 
They'd flow out in a stream of ice flurry from his four-gallon drums, then settle in a heap of black and olive speckled claws, spiky legs and black flappers waving frantically. One night, my mother caught me holding a broomstick with an angry Muddy's claw clamped around it. She ordered me to stay away from the crabs, reminding me of why Uncle Eric lost his finger. They could even snap a clothes prop in two. My mother went back to the city. I stayed a week and my grandfather showed me what to do. First throw one into a bucket of ice to slow it down, then bind the claws together with kingfisher blue twine in a slip knot. Old Dutch would come to take them to the co-op in his truck, packed into the fish boxes covered with ice. My grandfather would leave again for his next catch. He takes some pigeons with him in a cage on the trawler. If he had a good haul, he'd let one of the birds go. When it came home, it was my job to ride the bike into town and order the ice. When I reached the co-op, Dutch would ask how many pigeons. If there was more than one, it was a box of ice, a bird. He'd send the ice to my grandfather the next morning on the mail boat. They talk about the time Farfar got drunk up the river at Spencer. The river postman saw him through the mist one morning, balancing on the net boards at the stern of his boat, singing aloud, throwing pigeons at the sky. 